the things that have blessed me the most in my life that I, I just really love, I love being accepted as I am. I love being forgiven. I am forgiven. I'm not up here because pastors are perfect. I'm up here because I'm a trophy of the grace of, of, of the blood of Jesus Christ. I've been bought at a high price. I am forgiven. I, uh, I'm loved by the creator of the universe. And I love that I'm loved by the creator of the universe. I am blessed and I love being Yumi's husband. Hello, honey. I, uh, I almost feel like I cheat when I teach on marriage and everything because my life is so blessed. And, uh, I mean, it's not my fault God likes me more than you and gave me an awesome wife. But <laughs> that's not true. I mean, the part about giving me an awesome wife, that part, <laughs> that part is true. <laughs> I am blessed, Megumi Chia Aiko Aaron, I am blessed to be your papa. I love it. Every single day, I don't go a day without thinking how blessed I am. I love to see your faces. I love to spend time with you. Uh, you are wonderful people. I thank you for that. All, you know, as a kid growing up, I just wanted to be a dad. Isn't that funny? I was a little kid and wanted to be a dad. And it's going too fast. But I love it. I love having the joy and privilege of being able to shepherd uh, one of God's little flocks. I love that. I love you folks. I love to see your faces. I love getting together. I love hearing our voices united in, in song. That's powerful. Do you know I dream about that? I dream about just the sound and the singing and the praising God. And I, I just, I just blessed by it. I think it's just like a little bit of foretaste of heaven, you know? All, all the different races and all the millions and billions of people from all over the place and all worshiping and praising God together. Might as well get a, a jump on it now, right? I mean, why wait? Why wait? Start singing now. Uh, even when I was a little guy, again, I, I always loved children. Uh, Mom could tell you that I would grab children's cheeks in the stores. <laughs> You're so cute. Your parents loved that. Uh, I Especially toddlers. I've kind of always had a soft spot for toddlers. I like the way they toddle. And uh, even when I was little, looking at other kids and wanting to be a dad, thinking that would be the greatest thing in the world. When I grew up, started to grow up, and I started to notice the opposite sex, you know, and started looking around. I honestly wasn't just looking to have some fun. I was... I'm looking to see, find me a gal that can help me start this family, uh, be a wife and mother. I love kids. I love family. Guess what? Guess who else loves kids and loves family? We, well, we sang to him this morning. We've been praying to him this morning. It's, it's our Heavenly Father. He, he created the whole concept. Marriage is not a human institution. We didn't invent marriage. Marriage was on God's mind. He said, the union between a man and a woman is going to resemble my love for the church. That intimacy, that level of connection. And God get, did you ever think about this? You know how these little guys with their diaper butts, you see those massive cheeks they have, all four of them? Uh, <laughs> God, God made that. Isn't that cool? You look at a little kid, you say, oh, they're so cute. Japanese say, you just want to cut your teeth. Oh, so cute. And they're so cute. And God made those chunky faces. That's the way God made it, is his idea. Children are a blessing from God. And uh, just to go along with what Brother Jason said, you'd think in a civilized country you ought not to be killing them. Let's, I mean, that's a minimum standard of civility. Children are a blessing from God, and uh, we want to love and we want to protect the kids. We want every child to grow up and know, man, there are people that think they're just crazy about them. Because you know what? God's crazy about us. You think that's, you think that's irreverent to say God's crazy about us? God's crazy. God is, well, we turn our back on him all the time. We don't have enough time for him all the time. We, we walk away from him all the time. We say, I'm going to do things my way all the time. And he says, I'm going to die for you. To me, that's pretty crazy love. 
it doesn't even make sense from a human point of view. God has that kind of love for us, and you know what? We, uh, we got to have more love for the kids. We love children at, at our church, and we want every child to know that they are loved and valued. In chapter 18, remember we saw the apostles, and the apostles are, were not at that time. We think the, the great apostles, right? At that time, they weren't the guys who are going to go on to write the New Testament. They had a lot of evolution. They had a lot of change to take place in their lives before they could be the, the men that God would use to shake the very world. And here these fellows are. They've been spending time with Jesus. You ever think, boy, I'd be a good Christian if I could hang out with Jesus? Not necessarily. They were hanging out with Jesus. And they're having this argument over which one of them is the greatest. Isn't that kind of miserable? Here's God in flesh. Why would you for a moment think about your own glory when you're in the presence of God in flesh? And yet, they're arguing over which one of them is the greatest. And you know what Jesus tells them? Which one of us is the greatest? And Jesus says, you fellas better be careful. Unless you are converted, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And whoever humbles himself as this child that he had with him, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You want to know what greatness looks like? Look at this toddler. You want to know what greatness looks like? This is what God, the things that God values. And then, and then in, in verse 5 of chapter 18, And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Jesus says, when you love and bless a child in my name, I'm going to love and bless you. God takes children seriously. Children are important to God. Children matter in heaven. But, verse 6, listen, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better to have for him to have a heavy millstone. And this is not one of those little ones that you grind your flour with. This uh, word for millstone meant one of those big ones that was on a huge wheel that you had to have a, a donkey or an ox turn. This giant millstone. He said, if you cause one of these little ones to, uh, to sh if you shake their faith in me, it would be better for you to have a heavy millstone hung around your neck, and then you're tossed down into the depths of the sea. It would be better for you. It would be better for you. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. Stumbling blocks are the things that cause people from not seeing the love of God, from not knowing that the heaven's doors are wide open and anybody can go to heaven if they would just come. For it's inevitable that stumbling blocks will come, but woe to the man through whom the stumbling blocks come. Let's turn now to Book of Matthew, chapter 19. <clears throat> 13 through 15. <clears throat> then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. The disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went from there. J. Vernon McGee points out that, uh, pay attention, notice this, Jesus, remember what did we talk about last week? Marriage and divorce, that's right. Right after talking about divorce, Jesus Christ starts talking about children uh, children are paramount. paramount. Uh, Jesus talks about children right after he talks about divorce. And interestingly, remember we saw last week this Bible verse from the Malachi, the Italian prophet, Malachi, okay, Malachi, in the Old Testament. And uh, Malachi says that God hates divorce. And when we think, oh, God's nice and warm and fuzzy, and I think he wears pastel colors, and he's always sweet. No, God hates divorce. God hates divorce. God hates sin. God, God hate, hates lying and God hates gossip. All these things that ruin us. And you say, well, how can God hate? Well, think about a little child that has cancer. A parent is going to hate the cancer in that child. And God hates what sin does to we human beings. And the Bible says God hates divorce. 
Malachi 2, 13 through 16. Another thing you do, see, God is bringing his accusation against the people. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and you wail because he's not listening to you any longer. He's not accepting your sacrifice. He's not pleased with the sacrifices of your hands. You ask, why? Why isn't God listening as we weep and wail and cry? It is because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one, one in flesh and in spirit? They are his. And why did God do this? Why one? Because, because God was seeking godly offspring. Why did God create marriage? Why did he bring men and women together? Because he wants to have kids that grow up and love the law of God, love the, the, love the love of God, love God himself. He wants families to raise Christian children. Why does God bring a man and woman together so that we can raise up the next generation of believers? So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Guard yourself in your spirit where you start talking to yourself. Guard yourself right there. Do not break faith with your wife. I hate divorce, says the Lord, God of Israel. Going back to Matthew 10, the parallel account is found in Mark 10, which is kind of convenient. Uh, it says that when Jesus saw the apostles keeping the children away, it made him indignant. You ought to be afraid if God, who's created a trillion, trillion stars, gets indignant. God is upset. The, the apostles start to, start to keep the children away. Don't bring the children to Jesus. And God in flesh becomes upset with that. Hey, what do you think you're doing there? Do not hinder the children from coming to me. Do nothing that would stop the children from coming to know me. Jesus was angry with these adults. Last week we talked about what really cr hacks Christ off. Well, here's another one. Keeping children from knowing him. In chapter 18, we saw that if anyone does something to hurt the faith of a child, it would be better for that person to have a huge grinding millstone tied around their neck and tossed overboard into the ocean. Brothers and sisters, is there any possible way Jesus could be more intense about this? What? You guys have heard that verse too often to be affected about it the way people would have been affected by it. What if I stood up here and it wasn't in the Bible and said, boy, be better off for you if you just had your millstone tied around your neck and done. You'd think, whoa, Dan, settle down. Well, don't tell Jesus to settle down. He knows what he's doing. Presumably, he's God in flesh. I'm going with the belief that he knows what he's doing. Jesus was indignant. He was angry that anybody would do anything that would keep children from knowing him. Jesus said, let the children come to me. You know, I briefly thought about preaching it because I, I, uh, mom did the announcement about sex trafficking. Jason was talking about abortion. I briefly talked about preaching on these kind of topics, these horrible things that can happen to a child in this messed up, messed up world. Horrible, horrible. Uh, mom and dad abusing drugs and, al and being alcoholic. What does that do to kids? Child abuse, physical, men uh, mental, emotional, verbal, sexual. Sex trafficking. Lying to young women trying to find jobs. Young girls many times. Uh, abducting them. Abortion. Which is a word that does not explain the horror of what's going on. Infanticide. There are academics in the United States who believe that uh, since abortion is legal, infanticide should also be legal. One man said up to about the age of two or three. He's a college professor at a prestigious university. Because he said they, they're not self-aware and parents should be able to decide for themselves whether they really want to be parents. Abandonment. We're leaving kids somewhere exposure in a trash can. These things are real. Childhood 
childhood should be filled with laughter. It should be an adventure. And it can be like a torturous hell. And it is for millions and millions and millions. Millions of homeless children around the world. Millions of children who have been abused and neglected and are not cared for. But the thing is, I decided not to go that direction. The thing is, most kids are not going to be blocked from coming to Jesus because of these big headline making things. Most kids, most kids in this world are going to miss Jesus because their folks and the other adults in their lives are not giving them a strong, consistent example of what Christian life looks like, what loving God looks like. Remember that stat from, from the uh, largest uh, uh, Protestant denomination in the United States, uh, the, the Southern Baptists? They, they were saying it was like 80-some percent of their children go to, go to church. Their children go to church, they go to high school, they go to college, they get jobs, and they leave church. The Christian, the way we do Christianity, America, we're being blasted by hell, we're getting shelled, we're standing around saying, well, well, we're losing our kids, and what do we do? We do this church the same way again next year, and same way again next year. We need to think differently. And stop, let's stop telling Christians, don't get too spiritual. Uh, let's stop telling Christians, don't get too carried away. When Jesus is saying, how dare you keep the children coming? If you do that, it'd be better for you to have a... Jesus was intense. Jesus, the same guy that was going to hang on a cross for our sins, took children very seriously, took all of us, and we just kind of say, well, let's have another youth group party with pizza. That'll do it. Jesus is, is like a laser beam focused on winning children for the kingdom of God. How many children grew up and missed the grace of God because their parents didn't take them to Sunday school when they were children versus how many were abducted by slave traders? Pastor, can't we talk about slave traders because I felt more comfortable then? Get your kids to Sunday school class. How many little boys grow up and think religion is a joke for sissies because they don't see dad singing in church. They don't see dad pray. They don't see dad read his Bible. They don't see the other men in, in church worshiping God. Religion is for girls. How many boys grew up and miss Jesus versus how many of them miss him because they were beaten or abused? Far more children grow up and live lives apart from God because their parents didn't go to church very often or complained about it when they did complained about the people in the pew behind them, complained about the people two rows ahead, complained about the pastor, complained about the worship team, complained about everything, versus how many children grow up and miss God because they're abandoned on a street corner. I'll tell you what, as many children are abandoned, it's minuscule to the number of children who are missing out on God because all their parents do is complain about church or don't go. How many children grow up and think a job is important, and it is, and school is important, and it is, because you have to go to those, and you have to be on time, but church is not important because you just skip when you're tired or if it's too cold out. Isn't that the message that the kids get? Kids are smart. They watch mom and dad. You got to go to work. If you want to live, you got to go to work. Got to go to school. You don't got to go to church. Too tired. I need to rest on Sunday morning. Too cold. There's an indignant God that's watching. God loves you kids. He died for them. And he wants to be with them forever, for eternity. In my heart, am I loving the things God loves? Am I really loving my kids when I show them church is not a priority? Or how about the way we use our money? Ooh, hoping pastor wouldn't say that one. Cell phone, check. Cable TV, check. Fancy cars and homes, check. Eating out at restaurants all the time, check. Guess what? None of those things are bad. I'm not trying to make people feel bad. But what about when we prioritize them over God? Then they can become bad for us, can't they? I've got money for my cell phone. I've got money for... For 10 bucks at McDonald's, but I can't put any money in the offering plate this week. And kids see that. Do you think kids don't see that? 
They know what mom and dad thinks is important. Jesus taught in Matthew 6.21 that where you put your money shows what you love. I'm not the one making this up. Where you put your money shows what you love. And children are little geniuses. They get it. They know that. They watch their parents. They understand what's valuable. Is God's work worth investing in? I remember when we were living in our little apartment in Japan in uh, Little Megumi. I had my laptop there, and I remember one day I looked over. I'm typing on there. I looked over, and she's sitting next to me, and she's just like three years old or something. She had made a Lego laptop. It was gorgeous. It was with buttons on, with a screen and everything. And she was sitting next to me because she thought computers are important. Uh, Megumi liked fish tanks. And she'd look at the fish a lot because I liked my fish tank. She liked ice cream. I remember the first time I ever had uh, Haagen-Dazs ice cream. It was, it was in Japan. And it was uh, car caramel, maybe? And uh, cra caramel deluxe or whatever. I don't even know how they say it. It's some Frenchy way to say caramel ice cream. And, uh, and uh, sorry, French people. And, uh, and so I took a bite, and I just took a little bite. I said, oh. And Megumi was this little guy. And she, I want some, just like that, just because of my reaction. And uh, Megumi liked my big chair. I'd go to work, and boom, she'd be in my big chair. Just because uh, Papa liked those things. So she liked those things. And, and when we would be out and driving around in our car, and you'd drive on the other side of the road with the other side of the car over there, and, and uh, we'd see a cross or a church or a Coca-Cola truck, she would yell out, Papa no Sukinano, that's Papa's favorite. Kids know what's important to mom and dad. They know it. Do your kids know that Jesus is important? Do kids know that sharing the gospel is important in your life? Do kids know that supporting the work of God with your time, your talent, your treasure, they know that's important to you? Kids matter to God. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, you know, Moody Bible Institute down in Chicago. My grandma went there. My mom went there. I went there briefly. Uh, D.L. Moody once spoke at a meeting. There was not a lot of people there. And so he came back from this little meeting and they asked him how it went. He said, well, two and a half people were saved. And they said, oh, two adults and one child? He said, no, 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 no. Adults have used up half their life already. I meant two kids got saved and one adult. The kids got a full life left to live. In Peter's first public message there in the book of the Acts, he tells them this message, this gospel, how you get saved, how you get right with God. Listen, Peter said, this message is for you and for your children. Isn't that beautiful? The Christian's church started with this sermon. The very first sermon said, this message is for you, and it's for your kids. This message is for you, and it's for your children. Because children need the message of grace and forgiveness as well. Now, sometimes people interpret Christ's words that we have to be like little children. They think, well, that's because children are so precious and they're sinless. There's two problems with that. One, the people who say that didn't have any kids of their own. <laughs> Secondly, even if we wanted to be sinless, and, and we can't, but even if we wanted to be sinless from this moment, if you never sinned from today, guess what? If you get arrested for driving 65 in a 55 zone, for the rest of your life you drive 55, it doesn't do away with the ticket for the 65 mile an hour. Even if we stop sinning from today, if such a thing were possible, even if you never sinned again, you're only doing what the perfect law of God requires. You don't get bonus points. There's no scale balancing things out. That's what you're supposed to do. You do that, you don't go to hell. You get per you're per but it doesn't do anything to pay for your previous sins, see? So that, that's a couple problems. Actually, there's a, <clears throat> a third problem with that. Even if we could stop at this moment, stop seeing this moment, we couldn't. We can't fix the sins in our past. <clears throat> but the third problem is the idea that Jesus is telling us to be sinless like children so that we can go to heaven. Uh, I don't think that's quite what Christ meant at all. If you think about it, if that's what he did mean, it would contradict the rest of scriptures. And incidentally, if that's what he's telling us how to be saved, there wouldn't need to be a cross, would there? We'll just stop sinning and be like children for this. Day. So 
<clears throat> if we could get to heaven by being like sinless, innocent children, which we've shown three reasons why that's not the case, Jesus would not have had to die for our sins. So what does Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean when he says that the kingdom of heaven belongs to these little kids? Well, I think there's a few things that we can think about. One is that uh, children are just naturally desperate for their parents, especially mom. I always remember this. It was so adorable. Uh, we were living at mom and dad's house, grandma and grandpa's house, because we had come back from Japan, and it was before, or maybe right when we're starting Foundation Bible Church. And uh, we, Yumi went back to visit friends and family and to make a circuit of some churches there and, sit, and talk at a few churches. And, and I was with little Aiko, and she was just super small at that time. She could, she could kind of, you know, toddle. But, uh, and she knew a few words, but she didn't know any sentences yet. And it was like the second day that mom was gone, or, or maybe, maybe it was the third day, but mom was, was gone, and she's in Japan. And I was watching television in the living room, and I heard from the bottom of the stairs that, Dining room was dark, the upstairs was dark, and at the bottom of the stairs, this little girl with diapers on said, Mama, where are you? And I thought, wow, desperate times call for desperate measures. She needs to learn how to talk. <laughs> Mom, I'm not fighting you around here. Where are you? And I thought, think, you know, so sad when parents, children lose their parents, and her mom was just visiting friends and family. But the same way children are, mama, uh, are desperate for mama, we got to be desperate for God. Be like a little child. I need you. God, where are you? I need you. I need to be with you. I need to be close to you. Uh, you bring me life. You bring me nourishment. You, you, you sustain me. And, and children run to their parents for help. Uh, I told you a story. We were in Japan. We were watching Anastasia, this story about this. She's supposed to be a princess of Russia or something. And, and there's a, a scene in there where the evil wizard turns into a skeleton and we're watching that, and my little girl's sitting over there, Megumi's sitting over there, and she's a pretty tough little girl. We saw, you know, we saw Jurassic Park together and Lord of the Rings and everything. She's watching this, and the evil guy turns into a skeleton. And boom, in a flash, he jumped, ran over mom, and was plastered to me just in, in a moment. Uh, and then when we were living at, at Rogers Street in Milton, I, I was upstairs studying in my office, and the children were outside playing, and I think Megumi was around seven, she was maybe five, Ike was around three. And uh, for a moment, I thought it was the worst day of my life. Megumi came running in, opened the door, and panically yelled, Ike got ran over. And my whole body went cold. And I think I, I some desperate yells squeaked out of my voice, and I I dashed down the stairs thinking, what am I going to see? Did she just bounce off of the car? Is she going to be okay? I'm, I'm thinking that we got to call. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we got to get the paramedics here. I dashed outside thinking that my world had just collapsed on me and realized that Megumi's yelling something about a big dog crashed into her. <laughs> and so I got outside, and there was a big dog that had crashed Ico over and knocked her down. He growled at me when he saw me, but... But he backed off when I ran and, and uh, scooped up Ico. Ico had, Megumi had used a bad choice of words. <laughs> Ico got run over by a big dog. <laughs> but the thing is, is when the situation was bigger than the kids could handle, they went running for dad. They ran for dad right away. And that's what children do. And that's what we should do with our Heavenly Father. Lord God, this... Life is too big for me right now. The financial situation, the health situation. Lord God, I'm so concerned about my children. I'm so concerned about my family. Lord, the church, this is bigger. God, and what do we do? Be desperate for the Lord. Run to the Lord. Run to God the way children run to us when they need us. Children know they need help and can't survive without adults. Do we know as much as the kids? Do we know that we cannot survive without the Lord? Children go running into comforting arms, again, usually moms, when they need to cry. And they go running into safe arms, usually dads, when they feel afraid or when they're in danger. When, when life is too big for us, we need to be quick to run to God for comfort. He, he's a strong fortress. Another thing children do is they want to share their lives with their parents. You ever notice that? It's hard sometimes. Uh, you're busy, you're working, you're doing something, and 
look at I drew another smiley face on a clean sheet of paper, and just like these other 20 I just did, you know. And, but children want to share their lives with their parents. They show you art projects. They, they show you little critters they, they captured. I used to torture my mom, I guess, when we lived down in Texas. She'd be doing the laundry and find dead lizards in my pockets, you know. Uh, little critters they caught want to show mom and dad right away, always. Look at what we caught. It's a spider. Great, you know. Uh, don't let that go out in the house. And they want to tell you the things that they're learning. And parents, for the most part, we love it. We love it when our kids are sharing their lives with us like that. You know what? God, our Heavenly Father, right in the book of Genesis, it's talked about him coming in the cool of the day to walk with Adam. And then right there in Revelation, Jesus says, I'm, I'm, I'm standing at the door, I'm knocking. Let me in. Let's do lunch together. Let's eat together. Let's dine together. The Bible says if we're alive by the Spirit, therefore let us walk by the Holy Spirit. God wants to do life with you. Share your life with God. That's what children do. Share your life. Invite him into every aspect of your lives. Revelation 4.11 says, You, God, created everything, and it's for your pleasure that they exist and were created. Me too, you too. You were created to bring joy to God for his pleasure. And that also includes the children that God loves. We need to understand that not only is God the greatest good, God is the source of goodness. Goodness, moral, moral, uh, moral excellence, is not something God made arbitrarily. It flows out of his character. It's the very heart of God. And as parents, the most important thing that you can do is to teach your kids to love God. As parents, the most important thing you can do, more than getting them to learn how to put on their underwear straight or how to wipe their nose, how to graduate from college, how to get a job, the most important thing that we can do is raise up children that are radically in love with the God of the universe. Nothing else compares. And God wants to be with our children in eternity. He wants our children, which are his children that he's just letting us take care of for a while, stewardship. He wants these children to grow up and have an intimate relation with him. Rick Warren put it this way, whatever is at the center of your life is what you worship. As children grow up, they can center their life on what other people think, peer pressure. They can center their life on sports, school, family, career, having money having fun, or collecting things. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. God created all of them for our enjoyment. They just don't belong at the center of your life because none of them last. So a parent's primary responsibility is to teach their children to love God is the first critical choice a child has to learn because it is a choice they will be faced with over and over at every stage in their life. Will they choose to live a self-centered life or a God-centered life? Brothers and sisters, those of you with kids, we've got to live our lives. The children are watching. Let them see what's important to us. We've got to value. Put God's moral character, God's truth, put the church that Jesus Christ died for, put that first in our hearts. And if those of you who don't have kids right now, or your kids are big and they've grown up, I want you to think about the way you behave at church and in, in coming regularly and letting the children of the church see, yeah, that cool family or that grandma and grandpa, those people, they really love God. They're here all the time. And listen to the way they sing and watch the way that man prays. P praying is not just for the ladies in the church. Praying is for the men too. Let them know that you're reading your Bible. Let them see that you're going to Bible study. We influence everyone around us. And Jesus says, Jesus says, do not hinder the kids. And if you're hindering them, God is indignant. Let's be on God's good side. We're going to close with communion today, and I want to do it, change it up just a little bit. Now, everyone can stay seated this time. Sometimes we have you come forward. We do it a lot of different ways. But I would like, if there's any dads here with uh, young children, with uh, children in their families, I would like you to take the, uh, the juice and the bread and distribute it to your children so that they can see dad taking a role in this, uh, if they're young enough to, to participate today. And uh, dads, set an example of what godliness looks like when you pray, when you sing, when you read your Bible, when you're giving to the church, when you're serving the church joyfully. 
And uh, I've asked, uh, let's see, Jason and Joshua to come forward for that. <coughs> Communion at our church is open to anybody who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. So here's the deal. If you've come to God, or maybe you want to do that today and say, Lord God, your ways are better than my ways. Lord God, please forgive me. I want to be a, I'm, going to, I'm going to put your way first. I want to live life your way. If that's what you want to do, then, uh, then uh, you're welcome to do that this morning. It's open to any. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.